Uh-huh. They have the chest wrap. They yep. have gloves. And the kids walked into the circle, and the one kicked the other one in the nuts. And the other. <laughs> Welcome to the Casually Fit Life Podcast. What is up, everybody? I'm Anthony, and I'm here with the coolest guy I know. You must be talking about me. I am. What's up? I'm here with Ty Fisher, and today we are going to talk about youth athletic development. Youth athletic development, but how youth are we going? Because from my understanding, we're going pretty youth here. I was going to start with... uh, prenatal vitamins i'd say that would be like the best way to optimize the scenario wow we're trying to build like a like a almost like a genetically modified baby well i was thinking about how to start this and i'm just going to jump right into it just pick the two most freak athletes you know one male one female and breed them and you're like pretty like pretty much halfway there okay who would that be uh Let's like, see, Tia Clara Toomey and J.J. Watt. Okay. Hey, all right. I'm not- LeBron, LeBron and Simone Biles. Is that her name, Simone, the gymnast? From, from the Olympics, yeah. I mean, like, the, these combinations can't be beat. Probably not wrong. Probably Serena not wrong. Williams and literally anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, uh, and Michael Phelps. Oh, yeah, maybe. I bet you Michael Phelps, Serena Williams would be, like, a good combo. Yeah, that, because you, or, like, throw Lance in there, too. Lance Armstrong's a little old at this point, but, you know. Well, he cheated, so. Yeah, none of the other ones. I'm sorry, no, no. He was caught cheating. (laughs) Yeah. That's that's the key phrase right there. Um, Yeah, so if you want to have super athletic kids, they have to be test tube babies. Yeah, you have to go pay someone to adopt their child. Yeah, or you just grow it in a kit. I think you can buy those online from like AliExpress. It's like 17 bucks, 17.99. But truth is, if you want to have a, a super kid, you should start with prenatal vitamins, then you should have your vitamins during the process because there's specific things that you need for development. And we can skip right into post-birth scenarios. You know, before that, though, just another point. You know, we're joking about um, getting a super athlete combination. But realistically, you know, get yourself and your partner in shape before you have Bang. That's yeah. right. So this is actually gene a good point too. Gene, gene expressions. Yes, the more we learn about genes, the more we learn you can turn them on and off with good and bad behavior. Exactly, so get that in order and then move on to your prenatal vitamins and then birth, birth the child. So shameless plug, I mean, um, Ty and I are pretty athletic, we're pretty intelligent, you know, we're pretty good looking. So if you're looking for a high quality, I don't like the word donor, if you're looking for a high quality um, specimen to breed, let us know. You can drop us a DM. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm into That'll that idea out. too. That'll work out. Once I figure out how I can like take over someone's body and exercise for them, like that would be so fun for me. So if that's a superpower, let me know. Well, does it hurt? When you, when you do that, do you feel the, the pain? I'm cool with it. Okay. I'm cool with it. I think it's fun getting better at exercise and you get better the fastest when you're the least in shape. That's true. That is very true. Okay. okay. When this baby comes out, how in shape is it? Six pack abs. Nice. <laughs> All right, done. Chiseled from marble. Um, so actually I did want to start as a baby the most important thing you can do for your baby is tummy time. Tummy you, time? Let me hear familiar? about this. No. So to develop an erect posture, you have to work on the muscles that create this posture. And mm-hmm. that means laying on your stomach, lifting your head up off the ground. So you teach yourself to be upright and aligned. 
like little baby supermans exactly what it is and their heads are so big compared to their bodies this is like a great seriously this is a big deal that can get forgotten pretty easily because your baby looks cute on their back because you get to look at them but lay on the floor lay them on the floor in front of you lift up work on those retraction muscles work on that upper back because we all know that the front is for looks and the back is for athleticism yes i love it i like it tummy time that's a good one yeah don't forget it it's a it's a super pro move pro move all right now we're gonna assume your kid can now walk i'm gonna say talk a little bit what's the first thing you got you got for a suggestion for me as a, a parent with a young kid talk and walk if they Maybe can talk and walk two, i would three uh two three years old i mean i would just start playing with them more physically you know mm -hmm. getting them to run a little bit maybe and you have some nieces and nephews so you know how crazy that can be it can be crazy it can be fun mm -hmm. um yeah they're a little they're they're past that at this point but yes uh like that f the five or six year old boy is like a ball of wild energy that just wants to like go crazy all the time. So I think uh, you get a room, a kid playroom should have like super soft floor. And then you just have like rock climbing things all around the wall just to like three feet. I like it. They're not going to die if they fall from there. No, It'll hurt a little, but. That's okay. You put like a little mat down, you know, so it's just not like a hard floor, but yeah. Yeah. I like that. I mean, we would jump off like the couches and to pillows and stuff like that, you know. Or just, not, or just to the floor. Yeah, that too. Right. So like, always, a, always a way to find a way to uh, play. Get a so little. now this is the point where I think it's super important as a toddler that they see you as the adult being active. Setting an example. Yes. Yes. Okay. That that goes hand in hand with our first tip: getting yourself in shape. Mm -hmm. Keep it up. Because if your kids, I know when I was a kid, my dad would be like, "Do this. Sit down and do your work," and he would be watching TV while I was doing my schoolwork. It just yeah. made me so angry. I was raging. Like, no, I want to watch TV with you. It's true. It's true. Because everyone should watch Days of Our Lives when you're like three or yeah. five whatever you start school. No, okay, I like it. So set an example as, as the adult. I mm -hmm. think that's super important too. And you know, I'm sure we were get into it eventually. But like with nutrition, you know, making sure you're eating the same types of things that you want them to be eating. Yep. And that makes it super easy. So I just bought a book uh, from America's Test Kitchen about making recipes for your kids from baby to you know, young child. And they organize the recipes by age. And then they put a little um, like a key as to what your kid can do to participate in this process. That's cool. Yeah. So your kids can help clean your weights. They can help you like put your clips on. They can help you stand up when it's really heavy. Yo, that's super important. Mm -hmm. Because like, I know um, I have a gym owner friend who has a, a daughter who's like, I don't know how old she is now, but maybe like 11 ish. I don't know. I just made that's that like up. a person. Yeah. I just made that up, but I think, I don't <laughs> know. Um, but point is she's like in the gym now, like actually doing like CrossFit kids workouts and you know, how many kids are out there really doing like exercise programs? Probably not that many, mm -hmm. but she is and she enjoys it and it's probably because she was in the gym like her whole life and seeing yeah. it it's like a thing that she's used to and she associates with her dad doing it you know so yeah it's a it's a bonding a bonding thing yeah exactly and i like the idea and this doesn't quite work for kids because they're like kids are like tabatas but stretched out across a longer time like they explode with energy and then they just fall over and then as soon as they wake up they explode and then they reverse Tabata. Yeah. Uh, so what's cool is that you can teach your kids to like a, you do your exercise and then it's totally cool to hang out and play on the iPad or like we do our work, we play around a little bit. We have some broccoli and some cauliflower and then cool. Let's lay down and watch a movie. We can be chill. 
Yeah, I like that balance. I think I think that goes with, um, you know, there's been a trend, I think, where parents start their kids in sports like really early, yeah. but not just like in sports, but in a sport. Mm-hmm. Particularly, like my kid is going to be a basketball player at the age of seven. And so we're just going to have them in basketball and only basketball until they make it to the NBA kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people will make it to the NBA, but that's Most like won't. 1%. So I think in that same notion of, hey, we can go hard and then relax and enjoy other things. Um, also, not trying to get too serious about anything in particular at such a young age, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like don't, don't stress that you're going to the NFL or you're, you're going to be a this or that when you're older. Like, it's just about having fun. Yeah, you just don't know. Yeah, you don't know. And right now it's just about build, having fun and building lifelong habits, which tend to happen at this young age. Yeah, so getting them involved in your, in your life fitness-wise is cool. Have them pick a workout, have them do the workout with you, you know, just have them run around and play. And there are some really cool toys for kids. And it's like a toy barbell and a toy box. And I saw a, um, it was a half pound dumbbell rattle. And that's just, it's too cute for me. I can't do it. Yeah. I've seen those, those like barbells and they even have like the kettlebell, which is to me, that's the funniest one because like you need it to have a little bit of weight to actually do what a kettlebell does. Yeah. They don't, they're just like an empty plastic thing. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. But it's funny. I love it. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I would love to do as a parent, and I don't have kids, but hopefully I will soon. Um, my kid, I need to, and this is probably going to be super hard. I need to let them go and figure out like make mistakes on their own. I need them to like go onto the ground and fall or try and climb up to something and then like take a tumble and then get up and do it again so that they can do it. Yeah. I've thought about that too, like trying to do that as a parent. And it does seem like that's going to be hard to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I I think my parents were great at it. I think they were just like, ah, whatever. We're not going to even watch you. You'll be fine. You were the youngest, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true. Like, we already succeeded a couple of times. So, like, if this one works out, bonus points. Exactly. Right. No, I think my parents were great at it from my perspective. But uh, nice. I, I do think about that sometimes, how it's got to be hard. Yeah. And, you know, you got to encourage them to try it again, which mm-hmm. is going to be hard too. You know, you can do it. Like, let's, let's do it again. Let's try it. Let's try it. You'll be okay. Yeah. You know, people might frown at, frown upon you teaching your kids to juggle knives at three, but whatever, they'll learn. Yeah, probably. They can only make 10 mistakes. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Um, now I did hear that you have to introduce a food to a kid 10 times at this age or earlier for them to acquire a proper like respect to taste. And what are we calling this age again? Where are we still at? Like uh, toddler, toddler. Okay. okay. Interesting. Yeah. I know that it took me a long time to eat and like certain foods. And now like you, there's a barrier, you cross the barrier and then you're like, cool. I'll literally try anything Yeah. because it could be good. Yeah, that's true. Um, I would say, you know, have you ever thought about trying to just keep certain things from your kids as long as possible? Oh like, yeah, sugar and like desserts and sugar for sure. Yeah, like you'll you like you'll sneak into another room and you know eat a cookie, but you will never even let them know that cookies exist. Yeah, until they go to their first friends' houses and they have an actual heart attack. <laughs> That's what I imagine would happen if someone was like, "Bro, I got a bunch of cocaine, but we got to do it right now." Yeah, <laughs> I've never done it before, and I feel like it would just cause me to explode. Never have sugar before until you go to your first sleepover, and that's that's it. I'd like to raise my kids um, with a primarily vegetable-heavy diet to begin with. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, and I think that would force me to do a better job of making vegetables and having them on hand. And honestly, 
I would just do like they have these cool little pouches. If it was up to me, I would just make different vegetable purees and just hit them so you can get like your day's worth of veggies yeah, as quickly yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Get it over with. And they probably taste kind of good. But if I'm also the kind of person who would drink like a 3000 calorie shake and then just drink coffee the rest of the day, but that's probably not the best idea. Yeah. I'm definitely that person also. <laughs> so anybody want to toss that idea around? That's why I, I stress those vitamins, guys. Take your vitamins. Take your multivites. All right. So let's move up past toddler. And now I want to talk about this kid can follow directions. They can have a conversation with you. They can give you some feedback. Um, so this is like elementary school, maybe a little earlier, depending on the speed of development, because everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets tricky because you're like approaching the age to start organized sporting activities. Yeah. Which I but, think, I don't think they're bad. Like, you know, I know what I said earlier, but that, that's not, that's not me saying don't do organized sports. I think you should do all the organized sports. That's what, that's, I, that's what I heard when you said that. Yeah. That's what I think for sure. Three sports, three seasons, one season off to yeah. yourself to have some fun and some playtime. Yeah. And like, if you start them at, you know, seven or whatever the age is, um, they do three sports one year, maybe the next year they do three different, entirely different sports. You know what I yep. mean? They will definitely be better at all sports or one sport if they have this variety of skills, because you have different coaches, you have different training methodologies, you have different like skill sets, but they compound. It's not like you play baseball and you don't know how to swim or you like, I don't know, play soccer. And then you go to any other sport and like, you have this translation of skill and motor pattern development. Right. And, and also just like, if you are talking about like, and we're ultimately talking about an athlete right here, right? Yeah. So athletes compete, you know? And so building that competitive, uh, a healthy relationship with competition through different exposures, you know, I think is a good thing. Now, do you have a sport that you definitely want your kids you'd prefer that your kids stay away from. Yeah, I don't want my kids to play football. <laughs> Solid, I agree. And I don't want my kids to be dancers. Really? Not because of the dancing, that's fine. It's all the bullshit around you're too big, you're oh, too yeah, heavy, body, you, body. yeah, you're too tall. Like all this body dysmorphia where the success of a person's career is based on how they look, but when you're six, you don't, or eight or 10 or 12, like hormones are controlling you, yeah. not necessarily what you eat. Yeah, I, I gotta think that that will change over time, you know, and our, our, our culture around that will change and it will become like healthier. Um, I just think that profession or like those kinds of sports are gonna slowly die. Same. Same, but I, I, well, I think it'll change, you know, cause like when you say that, what I hear is like traditional ballerina, mm -hmm. like, cause I think that's a very big thing in that world. Yeah. Um, I think like deep, like Russian origin or like Eastern European young you women. Anytime you want to be like a professional, like ballet dancer, or maybe like a Broadway dancer or something. I, I, I have no experience in this, but I think they do stress like that that like very thin figure but yeah, i think that's going to change you know and wrestling has some of that disordered eating in men yeah. now i love wrestling i love the idea of it i love the skill set i love like learning to be in physical contact like non-sexual physical contact i think is lacking in most people's lives for yeah for sure i i actually so yeah we're talking about this disordered eating thing here um it's weird. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I think that the disordered eating that comes from wrestling tends not to be as centered on like how you look. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, at least in my mind, it seems less harmful because it's more like performance associated. Like how can I compete in this weight class? I have to cut weight but I gotta like, I gotta be above that weight, you know, naturally and then cut weight to get down to it. Um, so I can perform better in that weight class. 
as opposed to, I don't like the way I look. I don't feel comfortable in my body because people tell me that this isn't attractive. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I brought those up because I feel like dancing and ballet in general is a female centric and wrestling is more male centric, yeah. but you still have both sexes having problems associated with calorie intake because the standard that they set for sure yeah it just seems to me that the one in the dance world is a little more like mentally harmful i could be wrong could be completely wrong about that but like like mental uh health wise it seems like that one's more harmful now we did talk about wrestling so i'm gonna pick i want i'd like us to pick three sports that would be prime and I think wrestling for a young child is, or uh, any sort of contact a martial art. Yeah. I like wrestling because it's not striking. I like non-striking martial arts because striking is violent, it's aggressive, and grappling is you can scale it up or scale it down. Mm-hmm. So I think you pick jujitsu, you pick wrestling. I'm not that well-versed in them, but pick a non-striking martial art, and that should be one of the sports your kids should do. Yeah, I would 100% do that. I would even I wouldn't be worried about them doing like the striking ones either to be honest with you. I would actually just at this point in my life, you know, I've never done martial arts really and I've only recently like started to dabble in them. I would love to have my kid try like a little bit of everything in the martial arts world. Mm-hmm. The ones that make sense to me anyways, but yeah. So, I I would pick a grappling sport i would be okay with boxing and taekwondo see i just don't like boxing because the goal is to punch somebody in the face yes so it's i agree with you but at, at such a young age like i don't know how aggressive it gets at that age and, uh, like i actually don't think- just watched a video of these kids and they look so cute they have the head wrap uh-huh. they have the chest wrap yep. they have gloves and the kids walked into the circle and the one kicked the other one in the nuts and the, and it definitely didn't hurt but the kid just turned around with his hands on his hips walked out of the circle and laid down and just started pounding the floor with his hands i just i really felt that so i i like it though because i i think again i i'm not worried about them getting seriously hurt at mm-hmm. that age but i think uh you know people in real life will try and punch you in the face yeah and it teaches you how not to get punched in the face or how to uh, handle it when you do and not be like freaked out or overwhelmed or whatever. So, so what's, your, what's your second sport choice if you have one? Uh, I like basketball. So I would probably have them try out some basketball. Yeah, I was going to – so I had wrestling and then I had a ball sport, and I don't care really which one. But people should know how to throw, catch, and kick. Yeah, yeah, I mean, throwing is really only going to come from baseball, probably. Uh, football, you could do rugby. Like, I mean, you still learn how to handle a ball and pass it in different ways. That's true. But I don't want them doing football. Scratch that one. I want to get them into it at a young age and have them have a really bad experience so that way they don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> nice. Or you just show them the movie of, like, you show them a bunch of playlists of people getting paralyzed playing football. Yeah, Jesus. Soccer is a good one though too. I'll go with that one. Yeah, I've seen some crazy, some crazy, crazy football injuries. Yeah, same. But soccer rugby's so much better. It's just football without pads, right? What rugby? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I I've heard that that's less dangerous. Yeah, I don't actually know the stats, but uh, I think when you give someone a helmet or covering, it becomes a weapon. Yeah. That's the same action. That's the same sort of thing that they say with like uh, boxing. They say it would be safer if it was bare knuckle. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds a little crazy, but I'm open to it. Yeah. I'm open to it. Uh, so, like, the thing with basketball, basketball, you have actual basketball, you have like street basketball, you have shooting, you have like the trick shot life or like, it's there's so much fun in basketball. You could just play a video of some guy crossing people up and they yeah. fall over and it's just fun to spend it's, some time doing it. It's fun, at least I think it's fun, 
there to your point there are people now who are famous on like youtube and instagram and probably tiktok i imagine mm -hmm. because they dunk and they're like the best dunkers in the world but they've never been in profession they've never gone to the nba or anything like that they're just professional dunkers and so like that's cool yeah um, but more so i think it's such a ubiquitous sport and it's just if you if you have that in your tool belt chances are you can go anywhere in america at least and yeah. you can like relate to somebody you can go to the local park and you can engage Play basketball yeah exactly so yeah so like basketball that's, that's one of those sports where like we talked about this before that we think it's one of the best sports to play the barrier to entry is a basketball literally yeah because there will be a court like there's a court near your house guaranteed yep free court near your and house. you could probably even if you looked around long enough find a basketball yeah if you just hung out by that court long yeah. enough there will be a basketball there <laughs> yeah at some point that's even better just breathe oxygen and you could play basketball exactly so i i do love that aspect of it as well now but, so i hate to do two bodyweight sports but i will say so i used to coach it and if you put in your kid in gymnastics, they will be better. Yeah, for sure. I could I'm talking that. any any aspect, they'll be better. I believe that. I've asked more of like a like a seven year old coaching gymnastics than I do of like most people my own age. You you what more? I'm sorry, I missed that. I've asked more. Ask them more. Like, you know, I remember. So you have four different events for women's and that's what I used to coach. I was like, listen, I need you to go over there to that bar and do 10 sets of three reps of these drills. And I want you to pay attention to these two things and call me over when you're on the last set. And they like go and do it and they come back and they're like, excuse me, can you watch now? And I'm like, yes, I can watch now. And then they do it and I'm like, good job, do this. And they're like, can I do two more sets? Cause it felt good. I'm like, yes, then come over here. And they're like, okay, thank you. And they come over and that's done. Perfect. Yeah, work. I'm like, hey, can you guys like send me the support on Tuesday at two? And they're like, yeah. And then they don't do it. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> damn. No, I think those are good. I think I would honestly like my goal would be to have my kid try as many sports as possible. The different team sports, the different individual sports. I love it. Being track and field, like anything, you know, that would be my ultimate goal is to have them try as many things as possible. So they hone yeah. in. Yeah. And to learn how to cope with the pressure of an individual sport and to know what it feels like to be on a team and rely on other people. Yep. Both of those things. And like I said, like, you know, this isn't something I think, you know, people think about all the time with sports, but I think you know, having your kid play soccer is another, just like I said, with basketball, like how it's everywhere mm -hmm. in this country anyways, but soccer is everywhere in the world. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a cultural thing that you can almost like relate to people with, you know? Yeah. And I don't think you need to be into sports to have your kid do sports. No, no. You know, like I really don't care to watch sports on TV very much. I like watching highlights because those yeah. are amazing. Cause you're like me, I'm the same way. Like I don't follow sports, but we're just into like athleticism and the phys you know, physical lifestyle and everything. So you're mm -hmm. impressed when you see something that's like a crazy play in football or something like that. A home run is like pretty impressive cause you get to walk to score points. Pretty like, badass, yeah. A penalty kick, a PK in soccer or a corner kick Oh, every time just blows my mind. Yeah, because like you don't you don't play soccer, so you maybe don't know exactly how hard that is. Mm -hmm. But because you've done so many like physical things in your life, and you know how hard it is to master something, you're like, okay, I know I have an idea of what went into being able to do what he just did. How much work? Yeah, exactly. Now at this point too, you don't. I don't think you have to join a. I don't think you have to join organized sports, but it will definitely benefit the kid to experience an educator and to learn how to navigate being taught something. I yeah. think that's a skill by itself. So coachability. Coachability. 
especially when you might not like the coach, you know? Yeah. Or the, the teammates. Or when, when you don't like the coach and when you don't like, not if. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I think what would be super cool, and this is something that I'd like to try, and I don't know if it's feasible, but if I take my kid to a, let's just use jujitsu, a jujitsu gym, right? I also want to take a couple jujitsu lessons because obviously I'm an adult and I'm smarter than them by a little bit. But if I can learn some jujitsu, now it's something that we can do together outside of that facility. Ah, even better. Yeah, I would do, I mean, ideally I would be doing all of these with my kid, like at home or, you know, if it was a gym like that where you go and you could do it, like, I mean, they probably have different classes (laughs) for adults and children, (laughs) but you know. Probably, but maybe not. Yeah, but you know, that's what I, you know, I would ideally be participating in any way I could. Yeah, now the cool thing about being alive today is that with like three or four hours of Google and YouTube searching, you can know a lot about how to teach someone a skill and the names of the skills and how the sport works. And there is somebody who is a genius in that sport who has already done a free YouTube series on how to start wrestling and how to start basketball and beginner drills for gymnastics. It's yep. so easy to be, to help your kids learn that way. Yep. So I think moral of the story here is just try as many different sports as you can. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And this, this probably goes up until like we said elementary school, Pro- this probably goes all the way through high school for being honest, but mm-hmm. maybe it starts to tone down a little bit. Yeah. And- start to get into high school you know i think the you just have to start the funnel wide and then you move it narrower and narrower and narrower and i think even in high school you shouldn't be a one sport athlete you don't have to do it competitively but like my sister was a really good gymnast and she played basketball until high school and she was so bad at it but she liked it because there was no pressure it was fun it was athletic she did things that were so opposite of her of her sport of choice yeah, I think that's that's probably the way it should lean towards in high school is like maybe maybe by that point you've chosen a sport that you really like, that's your sport. Mm-hmm. But then you can have at least one, maybe two other sports that you do throughout the year that are just really just for fun. Like you're not trying to, you know, be impressive in them. You're just doing them for fun. They give you something, like you said, that kind of is different from what your main sport is. So it kind of balances you out. Yeah. So I think that's kind of the way it moves towards. Yeah. And this could be the time when you decide if they're going to do athletics for a hobby, athletics for competition, or just being active and having a purpose for activity so that they can be a painter and be healthy, or they can be a computer programmer, but still have a healthy lifestyle. Right. Which I think at the end of the day, that that's, the goal regardless of whether they become a professional athlete, you know, yeah. Just yeah. To have the, that professional lifestyle kind of built in. Mm-hmm. Um, now, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so I had like these three basic phases for this plan and everything we just talked about kind of covers my first phase there, which I just described as basic movement coordination play. Yeah. Playing. So that's, everything that we just got through. So the next phase I have here and have a different next phase, maybe you have the same phase, but starting to incorporate dedicated like exercise specifically in the form of resistance training. Yep. So I don't know if you have the same thing or not, but when would you start to, what age do you think? Or or Okay. So let me, let me, I want to answer your question and I promise I will. So when we train people, we don't talk about their biological age. When we talk about them as a client, we talk about their training age Mm -hmm. and training age for, if you don't know, this is how much experience does someone have in this category of activity? The higher the age, the more um, precise, we have to push them the more precise or challenging that piece can be. And training age is somewhat sport specific, but the wider your base of experience, 
the less time you need to achieve proficiency. Yeah. So if you know, if you do gymnastics, you play basketball and you wrestle, it's pretty easy to teach you how to play football. It's pretty easy to teach you to be a good swimmer. It's pretty easy to teach you how to be a power lifter, right? Because you have the foundation. Yeah. You have movement patterns yeah. that have hopefully been introduced correctly. Yeah. So when do I want to start resistance training with my kid and it's in elementary school? I, I got no problem with that. I think as soon as, as soon as they look uh, like they can, um, as soon as they can play a solid game of tag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And let me be clear when I say resistance training, you know, a lot of times we immediately think of barbell, but that's mm -hmm. not what I'm necessarily talking about. You know, this is, could simply be learning how to do a proper squat without any weight. This could be push ups. This could be, you know, pushing a heavy stroller, <laughs> you know, pushing Carrying your, dad up the stairs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Pushing me, pulling me in a sled. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's more structured than play. So the kid has to be able to communicate full, like two ways and they have to be able to, and it doesn't have to be verbal, but they have to be able to hear what you say and do some sort of application and respond to corrective cues. Yes. And in my opinion, in like in a squat, if their feet are on the ground flat, like I'm just gonna let them squat a PVC and snatch a PVC and do presses with the PVC. And now like I want them to do the workout with me. They have their jump rope, they have their weight. It could be a blow up dumbbell and have no weight, but I just want them to start to move and I know that people will refine their movements with a little bit of coaching and a lot of practice. Yeah. Yep. I, I agree with that. I would, so I, I, it's, I see like you talking about snatching with a PVC pipe. So I would have them do something like that uh, at a very young age, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, as, as they, let's say that now they're like 12 years old or something. Mm -hmm. So they're like, starting to really start to develop here and they have some decent motor control now cool. now i would go the opposite direction and like those complicated snatches and stuff are probably out the door for a little bit um, yeah. in, in my book and we're going back to like just bodybuilding bodybuilding and power squat, lifting squat bench dead yeah and at this point maybe we're starting to work in a super light barbell but trying to learn how to control those objects you know and mm -hmm. build those fine muscles what uh what rep kind of rep schemes do you want these kids following at this point? Hmm. So it kind of depends, I guess. On the one hand, I want them to like actually learn how to do the thing properly, which would probably mean like small reps and more sets, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um on the other hand, though, maybe we want, we'll get into like some higher rep stuff once they develop, you know, that motor control. So teaching is 10 sets of three. Yeah, exactly. And then working out would be three to five sets of 10. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, but that's I mean, exactly what I was thinking too. Because I want them to spend some focus time slow yeah. And then when it comes time to challenging their muscles, I want it to be muscle fatigue and not lack of strength. Yes. I like, I like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we'd be doing. Yeah. Like those slower, those lower rep, just trying to learn how to do it properly. Then make sure like when you're doing a bench press, you know, you have all the right uh, muscles engaged and it's not just like, you know, middle of your back flat on the bench, shoulders forward, and just like throwing it around. You That's know? how you bench though, right? It is how you bench, but I don't want them to know how to bench properly. Fair. <laughs> yeah. So like the coolest idea in this is that I start an adult the same place I'd start a 12 year old kid. Yeah. Hand squat, push, pull. Mm -hmm. And then when we do cardio, you know, they could do box step ups, they can do jump rope, they can do burpees, they can do sit ups, they can even do like, uh, like wall walks, which are super fun. Yeah. At this phase of the development, though, like, 
like when you're just starting them again, let's say 12 or 13 or whatever mm -hmm. on like the barbell type stuff. So the primary focus for me is going to be on that strength con component, mm -hmm. you know, teaching them how to do that part. Yeah. And then when we do a workout at the end, I'm not trying to make them like get after it super hard, you know, just like it's an easy, an easy workout. Like it's almost like play kind of, but mm -hmm. still structured um, running. I think down. At 12 though, I think at 12, you're doing an AMRAP. Yeah, something like that. But I'm not worried about if they're like really getting after it as hard as mm -hmm. they can, you know? It's just like, yeah. Move. yeah. Now, if you are doubtful at all of your skills to teach this, get a personal trainer and just have them work with you once a week and then you just reinforce after that or twice a week or three times, whatever you can afford because this is literally the most important time for their development. Cause if they learn it correctly, they will always do it correctly. Mm -hmm. If they learn it incorrectly, it will take two to three, probably three to five times the amount of work to unwork those bad habits. Yeah. So the best teachers should work with the youngest, newest athletes. I mean, I like that. It's definitely a uh, crucial. Have, how many times do you have somebody? Team. How many times do you have somebody come into the gym who has had some success doing something incorrectly, some like moderate success doing it incorrectly, and then you try and teach them to take two steps back in order to go, you know, ten steps forward? But it's the like, deadlift. Yeah. They're like, oh, I deadlifted 345 and I watched them deadlift 200. And I'm like, how, yeah, how can you walk still? Yeah. But yeah. that's okay. But please, if there is any doubt, it's worth it. Just the beginning is always the most important. And then from there, you can find most things on YouTube. As soon as you like feel like you're out of your comfort zone, ask for help. Maybe it's one session, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, but they're, there is no better time like there's no better time for an investment than in the beginning yeah i know we had uh there's this kid who um who worked with me when he was like 14 15 16 mm -hmm. uh in the gym like uh, did personal training at that age his his whole family would come to the gym and do crossfit and but he would do personal training with me and he like played sports football wrestling that type of stuff and like at the time, you know, when, when we started working uh, together, you know, I basically taught him like how to do all the basic movements that we're talking about, got him up to like doing power cleans and snatches and nice. the more advanced CrossFit movements like muscle ups and stuff like that um, over the years. And, but now like exercising is such like an integral part of his life. It's like so ingrained in him their whole two car garage is like decked out with exercise equipment. They go, nice. he's 21 now, I think. And um, they go like hard in the gym as a family now, like in their garage gym. Does and he like, coach at the gym? No, no. But um, yeah, like it's like, so, it was such like a formative experience, I think. And it was, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously his family does it too. So that was a huge thing. Like, you know, it's not like it was all me. It's like he saw his father doing it and everything. So, but yeah, learning how to do it properly at that age, the kid is strong as an ox. It's crazy. Like actually crazy. That puberty power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So primed for success and then puberty just kills it for him. But okay. I'd say like, what are we now? Are we getting into high school here? Is there anything you want to, points you want to make for like a 12 year old. So I don't think that there is a wrong time to start teaching them squat, bench, dead, pull up. But I do think there's a time to teach it wrong and it will negatively impact them big time. Yeah, I think there's a time. I don't think there's a wrong time to start teaching it or doing the movements. I think that there is a time and you, you phrased it as like when they could take that input and actually do a correction. Um, and like respond to it. I think that's when you actually start getting into the fine details of like, of using a barbell, 
you know, up to that point, we're probably not using a barbell until they can take those corrections. Yeah. Or even like dumbbells or anything really, unless it's like super light. Um, One of my favorite tools for this would be um, a band that goes around the knees, a mini band. Oh yeah. Just teaching that external. Oh, man. It's such an easy, cheap fix. And I can't imagine there's like almost no movement where your knees caving in is a good thing. You don't do those squats where your knees come in? Only on uh, occasion. I do these squats where I, where I point my toes like out as far as I can, but then I also try and touch my knees together and then I squat down. Do you have any ACL left? No. No. Man, you could probably really twist it then. Yeah, I get some good rotation there. It's good. But yeah, that's a super easy, cheap fix. And give them a super light band. It's basically enough to say like, hey, don't don't succumb to this. It's just like a tap on the leg. It's a super easy life hack. And then have them do more pulling, pull-ups, bent over rows, uh, body rows, one of my favorites, band pull-aparts to create that like – you just did tummy time and for all you podcasters i'm like slouching to build into that erect vertical tall human being and you'll make them taller everyone likes a tall person i guess i wouldn't know me neither <laughs> me neither no i do Ooh. like that though with the band because honestly you know how often i've seen videos of like professional athletes like who are like top tier professional athletes who are crazy athletic and then you see like a slow-mo of them like a training video of them doing box jumps and their knees are like banging together almost every time so that person is a bad investment but they're also like i'm talking i've seen this with like you know the top you know who rg3 athlete? is who rg3 i think his name is robert griffin uh yeah wasn't or he Reggie? a quarterback maybe well I watched, I don't know. So I'm pretty sure he has three ACL tears under his belt. Yeah. But if you watch his combine footage, duh, of course he took his tore his ACL. His max height jump, his feet are shoulder width apart, and his knees are just caved in and tapping each other. His cutting drills, you see that knee just like wow, 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 wow. Some coach fucked up real bad. Pardon my bad words here, but wow that is a failure on a strength and conditioning coach or a sporting coach for not recognizing it and putting him with the right person yeah dude and honestly i think jumping is where you see it easiest mm -hmm. like I, like a box jump if you're standing in front of them when they box jump uh you can, like how they land on that box or even how they take off the ground that's where you see it the easiest i think gymnastics has a pretty cool uh term for this to defeat it and it's called blocking if you put your feet all the way together, your knees can't cave in. Yeah. So they do a lot of feet together work because you naturally learn to land and then to bend more, your ankles stop, they hit an end range. And the only thing left is to bend the knees and drive them out for a little more flexion. So uh -huh. slowly over time, like you allow them to create some space as they become more proficient as athletes. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's cool. So do you at this point treat them at, at a training age for development or do you, are we still going through like, I guess in high school, we're going to assume this person has a three year training age where if they start doing these movements in elementary school, you can start loading them in like a strong lifts pattern in middle school. Oh, is that a question? <laughs> Yeah. So like, I think if they have two to three, two years of two train years of training age, we'll say, you know, fourth and fifth grade from sixth, seventh and eighth. Now you can start in my eyes to, to challenge them with load. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. And I think it's all going to depend though on like, you got to judge the development of that kid, like from like a, like a physiological standpoint, like maybe they're just not at puberty yet. And mm -hmm. so putting load on them is, you gotta be smart about what you're doing. It might not have the effects that you were hoping it would, you know, and it might just be unnecessary at that point. 
uh, or maybe they're like ahead of, you know, standard development or whatever, and they can kind of get into that heavier type lifting stuff. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. What's that? I can relate to that. I was uh, my current height in at 12 years old, and I have not changed in 10 years. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I was the tallest kid in fifth and sixth grade. I was like, yeah, this is nice. And then everyone grew a foot and a half, and I grew none foots and no halves. I'm probably shorter now than I was in sixth grade. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, no. is, like if that if that kid is not like at that age of development yet, I don't know that it's I don't think it's necessarily harmful to have them lifting weights, you know, as long as they're relatively like capable of it. But I just don't know that it's even necessary or gonna have the benefits that you're looking for. So like just sticking more with like lighter weights and motor patterns and, and you know. Here, I think you could challenge their, their uh, muscular endurance, their stamina. Yeah, that, that, that could be done, yeah. Treat it more like a hypertrophy in bodybuilding, but the outcome isn't hypertrophy. It's right. muscle endurance and extended motor control under fatigue. Yeah. And as we know, you can get stronger without adding muscle mass. So Yeah, that's like the goal. Get yeah. as strong as you can and keep your weight as low as you can. Yeah, so... That'd make you a pretty damn good wrestler. It would make you a good wrestler, right? Yeah, so still stick with those squat bench dead. Um, do some pulling, high reps. They should be pretty good at pull-ups as kids. Kids are pretty light. Yeah. I mean, remember the, uh, what's it called? The presidential fitness test or something like that? Oh, the worst. You had to do pull-ups and I think I got seven. Nice. That's pretty good. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. I don't think you were a, a skinny kid. That means you were strong as hell. No, no. I at that point I wasn't. Uh, I I I wasn't chunky always. There were weird. There was a weird phase where I was chunky. So I think that was pre-chunk. Well, I was skin and bones, still am. So it's much less impressive for me to do pull-ups when you weigh like forty-two pounds. <laughs> and you're like bang, 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 bang. No, I, I, yeah, no, I think it's pull-ups, great movement for a child. Love it. Love it. Because you're either healthy enough, you're strong enough, or you're light enough. It's one of my favorite fitness tests of all time. Great one. Okay. Now, middle school, you're doing high reps. You're incorporating some load, increasing weight slowly over time. We're talking two and a half pounds, slow, easy gains. Now, high school... Do you, want to, do you want people to choose their sport in middle school or do you still want to try different sports? Because the goal is to have them be a successful athlete in a sport, let's say college. Yeah, I, don't, I still don't think you have to choose it definitively in, in middle school. Should you narrow it down to three or four or two? It should be, there should be a clear direction. Like there might, there might be like two or three, yeah, like you're saying. Um, Find their affinity. There's yeah, there should be something that's starting to stand out. But I still think they're at this age where it's like they have a lot of structure in their practices and in their now they're doing like training sessions, maybe like occasionally, and they have a lot of structure in that. But also they have days where they just don't feel like doing it. And like, that's still okay, you know, like, yeah, that's fine. But when they do it, it's structured. You know what I mean? One of the things actually that I have my parents to thank is the kid chooses to do the sport. You guys choose it together. They have to finish the season. Yes. And then that. they can stop. We did that too. Yep. No quitting. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I think, I think going into high school, you should probably not have like 10 different sports that it could be. You should probably have like three if you have 10, then it's really none. It's really none, exactly. I guess that's what, it, I guess that's a good gauge. Like, if you haven't naturally narrowed into something that you like to do at this point. And you're good at. Yeah, and you're good at. Then, um, yeah, maybe it's not going to work out. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's something else that you haven't tried. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard this saying up more than a few times. Like, 
Oh, the best player in a sport that would ever lived never played basketball. Like the the person who was born to be the best basketball player of all oh, time never. never picked up a basketball in their whole life. Yeah, it's probably true. Well, I mean, Michael Jordan is pretty exceptional in that case. But yeah, the idea is the same. You know, yeah. your kid could be the best painter and they're like, okay at football and then they become a professional football player (laughs) but they would have changed the universe as a painter yeah 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 no i I like that that's interesting but i i don't even think so if you're going into high school and you have like three sports that you could potentially be going into for college yeah i still don't even think you have to like only do one at this point you know what i mean Mm -hmm. probably you probably don't have to get like that serious to the point where you're only doing that sport and then maybe like a super light fun one for off season, but not putting anything into probably not like junior year, you know? Yeah. That's a good point too. I just lumped high school as one big group, but track is a great multidisciplinary sport. Swimming yeah. is a great multidisciplinary sport. Yeah. Keeps you in shape, gets you doing something else. Training different sports is good for your body because it gives you a chance to recover. Yeah, well, that's another note that I have here, kind of, kind of, is that, um, you know, we think about like off season, in season, mm-hmm. and like how training should relate to to that. And Kelly Starrett has a really good video that he put up like a couple months ago. I think he called it the training continuum or making sense of the training continuum, something like that. But anyways, what he gets at, he sums up like this idea of like off season transitioning to in season and how your training should look. And that's kind of like part of that is like you're saying, playing another sport during that off season. But it's basically as you move towards in season, your training sessions, whatever you're doing Mm -hmm. in the gym should be a complement to whatever you're doing in the field. So it it should correct for whatever it is that you're missing from playing your sport. Yeah. And that's like, that's a profession, those decisions. Yeah. But like you can take that idea and kind of expand it into what we're talking about here with two sports, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever your off season sport is should complement that main sport. It shouldn't just be like, Oh, I play basketball and now off season, I'm going to go play travel basketball. (laughs) (laughs) How many times? I mean, we're not that old, but we've seen that a million times. Yeah, I know. The season ends for school and now they play travel ball and then the season ends for a travel ball and they do like heavy pitching coaching and they're not even like a good pitcher, but they just keep getting pounded with the same movement pattern. 10 months out of 12. Yeah. But I can think like if you are, if you're like a, um, any like land sport, basically, mm-hmm. swimming would be a great compliment to that. Yep. Let or, your body decompress. Yeah. Or if you're in a sport like baseball, then maybe, uh, I, don't, I don't know if these seasons line up or not, but like if you're in a sport like baseball, then like track and field could be a good one because, mm-hmm. you know, there's not a ton of running in baseball. And if you get out there and you start running like the mile in the track and field or whatever, like, you know, that'd be cool. Yeah. So track and swimming are my two, I don't want to call them sports that don't count, but those two are super easy to pair with any other sport. I, yeah, I would, I could see that. So, I mean, especially track because everybody runs, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you might not be fast, but you run. Yeah. Uh, it's good for your heart. Yes, it's good for your body. Uh, but swimming, on the other hand, is maybe a little bit more like skill specific. But hey, yeah. you can just jump in on the end lane. Nobody's going to pay you any attention. <laughs> we have been there. Yeah, you come in last place. It's fine. Yes. Embarrassing, but fine. It's fine. So I think those are two easy filler sports. They don't have to be the only ones, though. Yep. No, and be- your gym time and your in-season sport time, if you imagine um, a set of scales, the time should be opposite. So the more time you spend on your sport, the less time you need to spend or the less time you should spend in the weight room. And yeah. then as your sport goes out, you increase the time and intensity as well. So you shouldn't be setting PRs during your sporting season. That's right. silly. 
I if think you, that's a, a misconception though sometimes. Like it's easily missed, you know, in season. Like this is when everything counts. So I got to work harder. You know, I got to go into the, hit the gym harder, you know? Yep. So I think that's a, a common mistake. Yeah. And swimmers, swimmers are like the key, like, cause I've never heard someone talk about it this way, except for swimmers and some long distance runners. But when they're about to compete, they swim less and less and less and less. And they call it a taper because your body needs to heal. Yeah. Adaptation is made in recovery from sport and or training. Sport is a little bit different because it's skill based and not biological based. But your your gains are made when you sleep. You reinforce those motor patterns. When you eat healthy, your body recovers and sleeps better. Yeah, you know, swim less, do your sport a little bit less, focus on the lower intensity stuff. So if you feel like in season you're in the gym and it's easy, like that's kind of what I'm shooting for. Yeah, that is what you're shooting for. We're greasing the wheels, we're redoing the motor patterns, we're reinforcing things so that as soon as you're done your season, we can ramp up and you didn't miss out on training. You don't need to be retaught. Right, exactly. So that's probably like, again, that's, that's probably the same pattern you're following all through high school. The only ch changes I would say is like, like we already alluded to, as you get towards that junior year, you're, you're maybe dialing it in to just like you're not, you're maybe not playing all three sports. Maybe you're playing two now. And yep. one is just like, this is the sport. And the other one is just to keep me not bored in the off season. Yeah. So at this point, I feel like you come full circle. So you start with professional instruction because you build foundations. Now you have to go back to that professional instruction because yep. the difficulty and the expertise required to maintain a good athlete is now a profession again. Yeah. You so don't, you, you can't just have the, the high school football coach also being the guy who's in charge of like the strength and conditioning. Yep. And expect that to be enough to get you, you know, to deal yeah, that. That's a bad idea for two reasons. It works One, sometimes, but that's the exception. That's it's the exception. okay. You're right. It's okay. Like if I think about LeBron James, if he did Zumba in the off season, he would still be LeBron James. <clears throat> Genetic freak. He won the lottery. Yeah. I mean, but we don't know. Maybe he did have like a, a personal trainer at that age. I don't know. Yeah. So the, be if you want to give your kid the best chance, or if this athlete has the best chance of making it, they have a team where they're focusing on the game that coach is focused on the team aspect of the sport. They have an individual sporting coach that teaches them their specific position and corrects their minor faults because those are the kind of faults you make at this point. There's no major faults if you're good. Yeah. And then you have a strength and conditioning coach who is making sure that this person is not hurt, making sure that their body's symmetrical, that the training that they're doing makes sense for their sport. You know, you shouldn't be doing heavy singles for deadlift necessarily if you're like a baseball player because it doesn't apply the same way. Yeah. Now, I don't want to – I know I said a specific movement, it's and a I don't want to do that because there is a time and place for everything, and that's why you need a specific coach. Yeah, I was going to say, I think kind of at this age now when you're getting into <laughs> that college age – I think that's where strength and conditioning becomes not, it's not the most important part, but it's the part that's going to separate you from the rest. Yep. Because up to this point, you know, uh, presumably all the kids that you're now competing with have also been playing sports their entire lives too. So everybody has had the same or close to the same exposure as far as like the skills and the movements in the sports. Uh, but what you might not have or what they might not have is that same sort of dedication and experience in the gym, which, you know, you take two athletes, same skill level, but one's stronger or faster or bigger, you know, like that's, that's what you want. So that's where the strength and conditioning component is going to come in. And I think to your point about like, there's a time and a place for everything, depending on where you come from, 
I know we came from like a CrossFit background. Like that's kind of how we got into the world of health and fitness. And I took that sort of mindset into like pretty much all sorts of the training that I did over the years. And it wasn't until I went to uh, Villanova and worked with their football team. Like I realized the one, the coach there, he'll have athletes who deadlift, um, but some athletes don't have like the right, you know, range of motion naturally to do it properly. So they only ever, those specific athletes on the team will only ever be deadlifting from plates while other athletes will be deadlifting from the ground. And it's like, if you just come from that CrossFit background, you're like, oh, but we got to deadlift like the full motion. But then yeah. you're like, wait, these are football players who they don't care about doing Diane, you know? Yep. <laughs> They're just trying to be better at football. So yeah. it's like that, changing that, that difference in a, like perspective or difference in like your mindset of like, oh, this is just, this isn't to be good at the deadlift and do a quote proper deadlift. This is to be better at the sport. Yep. Goal, goal oriented is yeah. what I'm doing focused on making you a better swimmer, making you a better basketball player, or is it focused on making you a better gym exerciser? exerciser? Right. I mean, exactly. the two have some, some crossover, yeah. right? Good motor patterns make you a better athlete. And the easiest way to build good motor patterns, the alphabet of sports is in the gym, is in the weight room. Yeah. No, I would agree. Words front squat is a letter. Mm, I like it. Yeah, that's a pretty good, easy metaphor. Um, Now, this point in high school, you're a junior. That's, you're right. Things get serious then because people are looking at you. Yeah. There is no excuse to not be strong and there's no reason like if you go to college with no weightlifting experience eh, it's going to be a little uh, tough transition because yeah. even if those people are the same size as you collegiate athletes have weightlifting built into their sport program and you will get bodied you will get pushed you will get shoved people start to play a little bit dirtier even in high school Two people, same size, you're right. One person works out, they will dominate just because of their fluency in exertion. Yeah, for sure. Mental toughness will be higher because you've tested that and made them challenge their mental abilities in a blasted cardio workout. You hit college, people get strong as heck. They get really strong in college. Yeah, they do. And, you, you know, you, another point there to it is, like you said, like the strength and conditioning component, if you're at any D1 school, like there's a strength and conditioning, there's a, a robust strength and conditioning like program for each yeah. sport that's there. Yeah, each, there's a person in charge of that specific sports strength training program. And yeah, for all of the D1 ones, for sure. And then, you know, even if it's not D1, like still you're going to have some level of that. So if for no other reason other than, hey, if you don't know how to do this, if you don't have experience in the weight room, well, you're going to have to do it a ton in college. And that's going to be really hard to do if you don't have a ton of experience with it already. It's going to be a lot more uh, stress than it needs to be. Yep. physically and mentally as well like you're trying to learn how to do all these new things and your body's taking a toll that it's never taken before and now you're also trying to compete in your sport like and every coach and this is a point that i think should be applied across the whole age development um every coach punishes their athletes with conditioning i hate strength and conditioning as punishment yeah it's the absolute worst it's funny yeah it's true it doesn't make you a better athlete. It just like pisses everybody off. Yeah. Ah, dude, I remember he had this like, uh, what's it called? Like the, it's like a climbing thing. Like you have the handles and the- oh, uh, Versa climber? Yeah, the Versa climber. That used to be the thing. It was like, do whatever, how many ever feet on that? Like a couple thousand feet or oh. something like that. 
a couple thousand. Oh my god! I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, the sprinting, I hate it. I hate, hate, hate sprint repeats. I understand why you're doing it, but people get hurt doing yeah. those things. Yeah, they pull a hammy because they've been doing a drill and they stop and they're doing a walkthrough and they're taking their time. Your body cools down. You're training your mind, which is good. And then the coach is like, Oh, you guys aren't paying attention. Go run two miles. And then everyone's like, "Uh Oh, my hamstrings, my calves, my knees, my shoulders, everything. They mm -hmm. fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if for nothing else, you know, Learn how to do, learn how to do all that stuff because a you may be punished with it, <laughs> yeah. And even if you aren't, you, you're still going to have to have a lot of exposure to it. Mm -hmm. So Just, I think that well, if you're in college and you are doing supplementation, college is the time to do it. I think high school you need to pay attention to your diet and try and do it on foods and not pills. Yeah, for sure. And then when it comes to high school high school you could do like protein powder and a multivitamin pretty simple yeah. in college now you're talking creatine you should be taking a bullet of a d vitamin d you should be taking maybe a b complex um this is where you can start to play around with it but in college as most high schools should but i don't know if they do in college there is a dietitian who works with athletes yeah see them just start working with them immediately. Check yeah. in with them often, check in with them regularly. Even if it's not gonna change too much in the game today, it will increase your longevity as an athlete. And college athletes can still get away with eating like garbage. Yes, for sure. And but if you want a 10 year career or a 20 year career, it has to start as soon as you can. That's what I was about to get at. Like if the ultimate goal here is to have a career as an athlete, like a professional career beyond college, yeah, then that means you have to get drafted or, you know, some, some sort of selection process has to, you have to go through by the time you're done college, basically. So now's the time where you have to start taking advantage of every like piece of the puzzle that you can. Mm -hmm. Because if you, the longer you wait, it's never too late, but it can be too late. Yeah. I mean, we've heard like the crazy stories of the guy who doesn't get drafted in the NFL until like, you know, a few years after college or something like that. Mm -hmm. He's like late twenties and now he finally gets to the combine or something. Yeah. But that's like, that's even rarer than making it to the NFL in the first place. You know what I mean? <laughs> what was that movie with Mark Wahlberg? In yeah. Where he was a kicker. What was yeah. it called? I forget what it was called. Ear, ear it was called Invincible, I think. Yeah. 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 I like I that movie. Irreversible. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be turned around. I don't know. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that was a cool one. That was a good one. Now, can we talk about pain and injury for a little bit through the whole process in the beginning, from the very beginning? Let's do it. Baby, toddler... They're going to fall and get bumps and bruises. But if they're holding specific places, even an element, like, yeah, you, you made a mistake. Yeah, I could see that happening with like a, like a elementary school age kid. Mm -hmm. if, if a parent's having them like run a lot of drills or do a lot of training or something and they're walking around like my knee hurts, my shoulder hurts. That's a problem. Yeah, it's a uh, kids are going to say, oh, it hurts. But if you hear the same complaint two, three, four, five times, two, three, four days in a row, you yeah. have to back off. Yeah. In through elementary school, they shouldn't be sore. They shouldn't be tired. They should be eating a lot. They shouldn't be sleeping more than normal. And I'm saying normal because I don't, I want you to know what your kid moves like or this kid moves like, but yeah. there is no acceptable pain level through that elementary school point. I would say even through middle school, like the only thing you can should really be experiencing, maybe like you said, was like soreness. Yep. So the soreness is the only thing I'm willing to accept and it shouldn't be often once, yeah. twice a week. Yeah. yeah. And you, it's important to communicate the difference between pain and soreness. Like 
one of the most easily recognizable things for soreness is soreness is bilateral pain is unilateral yeah that's true you know my my hamstrings are maybe you'd even hear the word tired like fatigue yeah. in middle school because i know that i felt there's i think there's a difference between being tired and being fatigued fatigued is like neck down tired is neck up hmm i like that you know, after you hit a hard workout in the morning and then you like on a weekend or you do a double day with a little break in the middle, or even after we did our level one seminar, like my body was done. It was ready to call it quits. I wasn't going to fall asleep, but I just wanted to lay there on the couch with my arms out and just kind of chill out. Yeah. I think, I don't know if, if it's the same, if what you're saying here is the same, but I would say like, even in the middle school age, that fatigue shouldn't be that common either. Like, yeah. like, on like a system wide level, like soreness is one thing, but like, if they're like depleted, you know, yep. that's maybe pushing it. Yeah. And it might be the training isn't the factor. Maybe it's the food, maybe it's the rest, maybe it's the school because school they're student athletes they are not athlete students. So yeah. brain function takes priority student before athlete. Right. But once you move into high school, now is when they need to be communicative and I'm cool with them being sore all the time. And I'm even okay with accepting a little bit of sport related discomfort. Yeah, like an ache or something. Yep, my shoulder hurts a little bit. My elbow hurts a little bit. I'm thinking of like a baseball player, you yeah. know. But these are things that we can get ahead of if yep. we're aware of it early on, we can correct it like without like crazy intervention. Yeah, communication is key. So the sooner and the earlier they can recognize that it's not both sides, it's one. It's not after one workout that it just hurts. It hurts after each workout for consecutive days in a row. And there are people for sports teams to take care of this. There's PTs, there's athletic trainers, like your strength and conditioning coach should have a good feel for this, but they need to know even from the very beginning, like, how do you feel? What does your body feel like? Do an inventory. You know, your shoulder's good. Can you move through range of motion? Like in high school, I'm okay with a little bit of decreased range of motion from soreness. You know, a little yeah. bit of decreased performance from being sore, which is good, normal. Once you get to college, um, it has to switch again so that you shouldn't be sore from your sport you should have a, a dedicated recovery plan is what I'm looking at. Okay. You know, if you think about a pitcher, of course your arm is going to hurt after pitching a game, 200 or 120 pitches at like 90 miles an hour. Yeah. That's like pushing human limits. Right. But there should be a dedicated recovery plan for after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your coach and your strength and conditioning coach, I'm looking at two different people. They, they know that you have to follow this plan specifically. You don't throw on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. That doesn't work. Right. You know, if you play football on Fridays, you guys should not hit the day before the game. You know, you shouldn't hit on Monday the first day you come back because you're still recovering from that sport piece. And if those things are happening, you just got to pay attention to it and, and see, because the athletes during a season shouldn't decline in performance. They should increase their performance yep. throughout the season. Right. And that's a difficult topic that I am not suited or qualified to coach through. I mean, it's really tough, right? Yeah. I think beyond, except for like the very few handful of people who really are like, good at that in the world mm -hmm. everybody else who has success with it is like it's kind of luck yeah it's definitely lucky you know what i mean mm -hmm. i'm sure like it, it's what i think about with any sport like you know when we're if you're coaching an olympic weightlifter or something like if you're coaching them at the the peak of the olympics and they're like a, a medal contender like there's so much precision that has to be in that plan for, from a recovery, balancing the recovery and the overload. Like there's so much precision that has to be in it. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't coach that. But theoretically that level of, of precision should be at every level of that sport. Yep. And you might be able to coach somebody that's at a, a lower level 
and get away with it just kind of based on luck, right? Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, you're not going to get away with that luck anymore. No, someone will get hurt or the team will start to suffer. So the, going back to that scales analogy, you know, even at the beginning of the season, you're doing more work, more reps that are full speed. And then as the season progresses, you've played more competitions, the, the demands, the physical demands of practice go down while the mental demands go up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in college, I think coaches are pretty good at that. You know, you do film days where you're not practicing at all. One of my biggest complaints with film days is that they make everyone sit at a desk for two and a half hours, all hunched over after the game. Yeah. Do my, my best suggestion and everyone will be happy for this is do film in a stand up hot tub. A stand up hot tub. I like it. Heck yeah. How good would that feel to like, you know, someone's asking you to think and it's like, you know, maybe not a hundred degrees, but it's like 92, 93. And you're just like, stretching out your muscles moving side to side that warm water is building up the blood flow yeah i'm about to go get in the hot tub right now is it open no nah, i don't have a hot tub but i'm just saying <laughs> you make, <laughs> make me think about it <laughs> it sounds so good it sounds so good so, so i'm pretty comfortable with with this plan i like it yeah i was just about to say i feel like we've kind of covered like gave an overview of the of the process i'd say get somebody on the right track is there anything you think like that we missed in hindsight or uh that you want to throw in and add mm, there's a bunch of cool technology and supplements and you know apps and games and things like that but i don't think it needs to be complicated i think simple in this case as you're building a foundation is better yeah. Squat on Monday, bench on Wednesday, deadlift on Friday. Make it routine so that you build like simple foundational habits because the goal is to be good at sport and not good in the gym. Yeah. I'll say a like, brief overview of what we talked about. Basically, like when they're young, play as many, as many sports as possible. Try them all. Love it. Keep it, keep it fun. Um, over the course of the career, you're moving from general to specific sort of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, starting to work in those mo basic movement patterns in the gym, learning strength and resistance training in that like middle school age kind of um, is when they kind of start and it takes off in high school and then getting more specific with supplementation as you get into college, really going back to those uh, expert coaches around that time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, well, if you guys have any questions or feedback for us, or if you disagree, leave us a comment below. I want to hear about it. I want to hear about it. Can't wait. Yeah, yeah this is a cool discussion. Once we, uh, yeah, we've been through this ourselves too. So this is kind of cool. Yeah. All right, well, for today, that's it for the Casually Fit Life, remember? Just be casually fit. That's good enough. Be healthy, be active, and have fun. I'm Anthony. I'm Ty. And we will see you guys next time. Awesome. Peace. Peace.